Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we've got uh, updates on Cubs and Sox baseball and a little bit of Bears news. Uh, but first, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family friendly, affordable prices. Season's over now, but that doesn't or shouldn't stop you from heading over to icehogs.com, picking up a hat, shirt, jersey, and signing up for the season ticket email list. Only 90 minutes from the city limits and fun for the whole family. Head on over to icehogs.com. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Oh, Alex, this is a uh, uh, been a fairly good Cubs week, I would have to say. Fairly. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of good things, some bizarre things, which I'm sure we'll get into in a minute or so. But, I mean, yeah, especially today's game, it seems like the offense is finally coming around. There are still some things that are, you know, a little dicey here or there. But I do like the direction that they are heading in the past, I'd say, five, six days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So since the last episode, we've had a a series against uh, the Reds and... I believe at the time the Reds were in first place. Am I correct? Uh, I think they were battling for the top, but they were above the Cubs in the standings. We were in fourth, I believe. Yeah, and so it was a... And everyone just naturally assumed that it was a get-right series. And it was funny because I I was doing it as well. And I stopped to think about it. I was like, why why am I assuming that the Cubs are just going to spank Cincinnati? I mean, I know the Cubs are a better team, but Cincinnati has been playing better as a whole this season. So I don't understand why I naturally assumed that. Uh, I don't know if you made that assumption as well. Yeah, I kind of was thinking, I was thinking two ways. The assumption that the Cubs are going to get it right was kind of in my mind, just seeing as the past year and a half, the Cubs have absolutely dominated the Reds like no other. But at the same time, I'm saying, you know, they're playing a lot better. The Cubs haven't been playing great. The Reds' offense has been really, really good, and their bullpen has been much better. So it was kind of one of those things where I said, we should win this series, but you can't really take it for granted. Yeah, and then they everybody was pretty much right, and the Cubs spanked Cincinnati and, uh, and got the offense got right for the most part. Absolutely, and that's one thing that always happens against the Reds for the Cubs is the offense swings away and does its thing. And the past week, we've seen more of traditional Cubs offense because there was a lot of frustrating moments over the past few weeks. Uh, They finally started driving in some runners on base, finally, you know, slugging the ball to the outfield or over the fence. Uh, You know, I think the home run totals against the Reds, like the past year for the Cubs, are like ridiculous. I don't know the exact number, but I saw the number. Uh, Though I can't remember it off the top of my head, I know it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, and and for the Reds, it was just a bad way to start with the wind blowing out at like, what, 20 miles an hour in Bronson Arroyo on the mound? Yeah, that's usually not a recipe for success. And one thing I was kind of worried about is... Yeah, he's an old junk balling soft tosser, but how many times have old junk balling soft tossers owned the Cubs lineup? Luckily, that was not the case, and they did what I wanted them to just wait back and swing away, and it paid off. Yeah, it, it paid off in a big way, and uh, the wind blowing out, and um, the only concern you have with blowing the wind blowing out in Wrigley is well that you're going to give up a lot of runs which right they gave up a fair amount of runs the five average five runs a game but 
uh, the other one is that guys are going to swing for the fences and um, come up, you know, striking out. Right. And really, what you just need to do is uh, hit line drives, and with that wind, will just take them out. Yeah, and you know, one thing about the Reds this past series, they scored most of their runs in kind of garbage time when the Cubs were already five plus runs ahead late into the game. I mean, the other day. When they swept them, they were up nine to nothing, and then the Reds started scoring runs in like the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning, like when the game was pretty much out of reach. And then in game one, the Cubs were up like seven to two, and then Votto hit one to the moon, but it was like late in the game, and they were still in full control. So it's hard to blame them fully for some of those runs, just because when you're up a lot late, you just, you tend to just kind of want to throw it in there and get outs and make them hit for you. So. You know, to an extent, I wasn't too worried about the amount of runs given up. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Is uh, That was one of the points I, I had about that series is they gave up a lot of runs. And you're right, it, most of it was when the, the game was all but decided. But still, in a, a series where you're trying to get right and you've been struggling in all three facets and pitching, uh, fielding, and hitting, is... You would like to go out there, score a bunch of runs, and then shut them down as well. Oh, sure. Um, so giving up, um, you got three mass starts, and you gave up some runs in, in garbage time. So it was it was nice because you got the three wins in the, the division against a team ahead of you. So that's, that's always really nice because it's like counting twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got your offense back on track. So, you know, you... It can't all be peaches and cream, but you know there was there was still some complaints I could have in that series. Well, one thing that I'm going to touch on when we discuss more in depth in the Brewers, and I'm just going to make the overall point now. The one thing that is still really angering me about this Cubs team is the defense has been just horrible. It's been really bad. Oh yeah, uh, I I mean. You know, I guess we could touch on that when we we talk to Brewers, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the Reds series was what it was. I, the Reds, I mean, looking at the standings is other than Pittsburgh being at the bottom feeder of this division, it's it's been like a yo-yo of juggling of who's you know in first, who's in fourth, right? Uh, and you know, it depends day by day, one day week, you know, one week Cincinnati's in first, and then they're, you know, then it'll be uh, the the Cardinals, then the Brewers, then the Cubs. And it's, it, you know, I don't think any of those teams are nearly as talented as the Cubs. And the Cubs have been playing, I would, I would go out on a limb and say pretty bad baseball comparatively to what they should be on paper. And they're Phew, still... I've seen said the same thing, so. Yeah, and so it's, and they're, what, a game and a half out of first? Two games? Two games out. Yeah, so it's... I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried because the Brewers are going to sink back down to the bottom. Uh, the the Reds are going to sink back down to the bottom. Um, Pittsburgh's digging themselves a pretty big hole, and the Cardinals are going to use their their voodoo magic to to somehow, you know, linger up there at the top of the standings. But the the Cubs are going to run away with this at some point. Yeah, that's kind of how most people feel. Um, if you don't mind me, I'm going to share a little thing that I wrote about with the Milwaukee Brewers, just kind of as a scouting report of their team. Because, you know, we've seen what they've done so far, and you've seen the way they, you know, hit the ball around the ballpark, right? You know, hitting a lot of home runs and whatnot. Like, you've seen that. Yeah. So, I was looking into the numbers, and with the Brewers, through yesterday's game, so today's game does not count... Basically, what it showed is the Brewers are a team that really relies on slugging. And a team that relies a lot on slugging, well, you're going to strike out a lot. And I believe they are number two in overall strikeouts. If I could pull up the numbers here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, they're, um, they're second in strikeout rate, 24.4%, uh, and they're 17th in walks, 8.7% based on ball rate, so they're not really that great at taking walks. They have some good on base guys right now. Uh, you have some guys with an OPS above one, mainly Eric Thames. You could count Eric Sogar, but he hasn't been around that long. 
But you have guys with on bases like three thir- uh, 374, Braun, Aguilar, 329, Bandy, 359, Manny Pena, 341, Domingo Santana, 370, Keon Broxton, 326. So all either slightly above average or way above average right now. And a lot of that is the way they're hitting the ball. Uh, they got a Babbitt at 312, which is, you know, pretty pretty standard around this time. Uh, collective on-base percentage is 12th at 328. Their OPS is number two in baseball. Their slugging percentage is... Oh, sorry. Their slugging percentage is number two. Their OPS is number four. So it kind of goes to show that they're relying, their offense is relying on the long ball and, you know, hitting extra base hits, which it's good to have that kind of thing. But there's going to be a point where that's going to go cold and their pitching that really isn't that great isn't going to be able to hold it down. Oh, yeah. That's my thing with them is they've got guys that can hit, but this is this is baseball is 162 game season is eventually bats are going to get cold and you know sure they're not all going to get cold at the same time but the way that they're putting up runs it's going to it's going to dry up and when you're winning games 6 to 5 and 8 to 4 and things like that is all it takes is a little bit of cold streak by a couple of guys and instead of hitting three run bombs you're hitting solo shots you suddenly turn into the White Sox. Yeah, and another thing I wanted to add to the Brewers as well is the series before, and I'm going to conclude this all with saying I'm not trying to take anything away from the Brewers, but the series before this Cubs series, they beat up on a wretched Padres team. So, And then before that, a very wretched Mets team right now. So... Again, I'm not taking anything away from the Brewers because I think they have a really bright future and they have some great assets. But the fact of the matter is, and you know, I'm saying this as analysis and not as a guy with a crystal ball because really anything can happen, but this Brewers team is not built to contend this year. They're on the right path. They might be closer to contention when we think, but this year, 2017, I will be beyond shocked if they are on top of the standings come September or even August. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I think I said this at the, I'd have to pull, go back and pull tape, but I, I think I said at the beginning of the season that I expected them to be a year or two away from com- competing because they had a, a nice young team with some guys that are, are going to be really good. Um, yeah, they have talent. They have talent. I just, I wasn't expecting the, and again, we're like, what, not even a quarter of the way through the season. Pretty so much. It's, uh, so we're, you know, there's a lot of things that can still happen, but I, I still don't see them being there at the end. I fully agree with you. Uh, in a year or two, it's going to be, they could be a potential problem depending on how, how much money that they're able to open up the pocketbook and spend versus where their pitching is going to be because uh you know milwaukee is a, is a small market as far as very baseball small. goes uh and they the problem with some of these small market well all the small market teams is that when you develop guys and, and you bring guys up is you might you might do really well with drafting and signing international players and and however you acquire young talent but it's you it's really hard to get good pitching and good hitting at the same time unless you pony up for one or the other right they're they're gonna have to pony up some money they're also i think they're gonna have to make another trade um and the one thing i'm looking at right now and i think most people are looking at Ryan Braun, are they ever going to move him? It seems like every year he's rumored to be linked to like the Dodgers. And the Dodgers have a really, really, really good farm system with some great assets. If the Brewers could pull off a trade for Braun and get a nice haul back, that's an even greater step for Milwaukee. Um, you know, maybe uh, this is a, this is a stretch and it wouldn't be a huge overhaul by any means, but They have a veteran former Cub, Matt Garza. If he comes back this year and really pitches well, you might be able to flip him to a contender as well. You wouldn't get a huge overhaul back, no, but you could get something. 
That's a big if he pounces back and plays. Right, more. that's a big. That's again, that's a stretch. But I'm just saying, potentially, maybe. Yeah, it's they have, they have the beginnings of of a problematic team for the Cubs in the future, but uh, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to spend some money and make some really uh, smart moves. I mean, yeah. just think about just think about the the Pirates who are they're a mid market team, and, and so I mean, I, I Pittsburgh's a bigger market than than Milwaukee as far as Pittsburgh. for sure. Goes. Um, and they, a couple of years ago, had this core where like, wow, you know, they're going to be contending, and they were never able to compete for the pitchers that they needed, and they just nothing ever materialized at the same time. Yeah, I mean, they had some really good teams. Like 2015 was one of the best pirate seasons probably in a long time for them. 12, 13, 14, 15, they had that stretch of, of playoffs. But the thing that always got to me about them was it's like, their top starting pitching was elite. What the Pirates never really seemed to have was any depth to it. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's as a baseball fan, I I wish I could see more teams be in the contending, you know, be contenders. Uh, that's what I do like about the NFL is that every team can be a contender. Uh, there's no barriers to that. It's you know the same draft process it's a hard cap uh you know things like that but baseball still i mean it's it's gotten better from you know not that the yankees aren't spending nearly as much but you know the dodgers and the red Sox, and to some degree the cubs have taken up the mantle um but it's it's really hard for some of these smaller market teams i was talking to somebody about this before and he's like well what about the astros and i was like well Think about how many years the Astros had like a top five draft pick, number one. They were number bad two, for a long time. Yeah. And number two is they are – is Houston is, the I think, the fourth largest city in this country. So it is a big market. Uh, it, you know, it's a it, – I'm sure their, their TV numbers and, and uh, their draw at the, at the turnstile is not what it is in Chicago or New York, but – Oh, it's no. a it's a big market. It's not it's not small. They've got they've got big money and they can spend you know not Dodger money, not Yankee money, not Red Sox money, but they can spend with that next tier still. I mean, they could still put up a hundred and forty fifty million dollar uh, payroll if they need to. I think the last non huge market team to sustain success playoff wise for like five years, the one I can really think of is Philadelphia. Yeah. And Philadelphia is still, still a fairly big market. And that's a, that's a team. I lived in Philadelphia for like nine years and the, they, they have a lot of diehard fans and they, yes, they the do. Stadium and the stadium stadium's really nice. Um, and they had a lot of homegrown guys and then they just went out and got, they got some pitchers. Right. Roy Oswald yeah. and Cliff Lee. Yeah. So they, they had, you know, a lot of homegrown talent in in the the fielding positions, and then they got uh, they they signed free agent pitchers and and just ran with it, and that was a really successful team for a mid market team. Right. Yeah, I should say mid market, not small market. It's they're not Oakland or Milwaukee or anything like that. Yeah, and those small market teams is just really hard, and I, I feel bad because. Uh, sure, it's always fun to go to a baseball game, win, lose, or draw. But it, it's uh, it's got to be hard to be a like an A's fan and and just know that you're you know in this day and age you're not going to compete anymore. Yeah, uh, the A's. I mean, they're they're a mess for multiple reasons. The, the the city is terrible. The stadium is terrible. The farm system is terrible because the last time they were good, I mean, they went all out. 2014, when they traded us Addison Russell, that is a team that went all out. They gave it all out for John Lester, and then they didn't even make it past the wild card game after having a lead in that one. Yeah. <laughs> it was, they went all in, and... Uh, I mean, you, you, can't fault Billy, you can't fault Billy Bean for at least trying, but it was, I mean, it's, it is what it is. They have a very tight budget and they, 
they have to make m maneuvers and you have to be somewhat aggressive to try to do some things because um, you, you can't play it safe because playing it safe sometimes costs you a lot of money and is what it is. You know, what's interesting is if you look back the past 10 years and not just at Philadelphia, let's uh, look at a few other teams, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh in 2012 ish around that time. Those are the two teams that, you know, they were battling for playoff spots. The, the Reds made the playoffs. Uh, the Cardinals always made the playoffs, but you know, we don't have to talk about the Cardinals. They're the Cardinals. Um, you know, they're, they're a mid market team. They're not small market. Uh, they're probably, I'd say they're big mid market, if that makes sense. The Cardinals? Yeah. Yeah. The Cardinals are a weird one just because it's their fan base. That's their, you know, it's a baseball town. So even right. though they're a mid market, they they crush other mid markets. Right. They have the fan base and the marketing of a big market team. So I really it's really hard for me to count them as a small to low mid market team ever. Yeah, I mean you you put I mean as far as their ability to spend and and draw, I put them as like the bot you know, the bottom end of a the top tier, you know, definitely upper echelon of, of the mid tier. Right. Uh, somewhere in that limbo. Yeah, I definitely agree. But I'm yeah, sorry, go step, ahead. They're, yeah, they're, they're, you know, a definite step down from the big players, but they're they're a definite step above the, the second tier. Right. So we're talking Cincinnati, we're talking Pittsburgh, and there were those years where they were in the playoffs, but combined, those two teams never won a playoff series. I mean, it's not really surprising. It's uh the the way baseball has changed over even the last ten years is um it, it's just getting harder and harder to compete with uh, without spending a lot of money. Before it was really just the Yankees that outspent everybody, and um you know you competed with. You know, you knew that the Yankees were in this upper echelon and everybody else was down below, but uh, you were all kind of mingled in the same waters. But now some other big fish have come into that waters and uh, it's getting much harder to sign players. And with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, the the price of pitching is just exponentially. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is, is I, I'm all for a guy making what he's worth, but the even bad pitchers now are making $15, $18 million a year. Yep. You used to sign, you know, mediocre arms for like two, three million dollars and it really wasn't much, but now that whole thing is changing. Uh, it's just the way kind of economics are going. The also, an another thing I want to bring up about what some teams have and some teams don't. You got to have a good farm system development if you're especially if you're trying to rebuild if you want to build from the ground up your development and your farm system have to be good you can't expect to like rebuilds on the fly don't work anymore so if you have prospects but you can't develop them that's not going to do you any good and it's going to set you back even further because if you have nothing developed if what you thought was going to develop hasn't developed and you're trying to make room for them well, then you have no valuable assets to trade for more of them, so you're really just kind of stuck being bad. And that, I think, is a problem that some other teams have. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem the White Sox had for the last six, seven years. Right, and I know we'll get to them later, and things are different there, but yeah, I mean, you look at things like, um, I don't know, let's say Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay has some good assets, but not nearly enough. And they've been kind of stuck. And also, they're a small market team. Look at the Kansas City Royals. They're a team that built from the ground up. Their window for contention was very small. They pretty much made the most of what they had. Uh, two pennants and a World Series. But it was like a two-year window. They brought up a lot of position players and developed a lot of those guys well. The problem was is that their pitching staff was basically a rented pitching staff of guys like from James Shields to Johnny Cueto to Edinson Volquez. Like they were a bunch of rental short-term guys and 
you know, when they left, it's not like they could afford to go out and get big arms. And even if they could spend the money for an arm, they still had way more holes to fill. And there really wasn't anything left in the tank. And some of their guys that they had, like uh, Alex Gordon, he wasn't really a guy brought up through the system. But he was a main part of their core. And now he's old and bad. And some of the other ones have been getting hurt. So, it, you know, it kind of puts in perspective how... Windows for contention for multiple teams are very different depending on A, the market size, B, the kind of assets and development you have in the farm system, and, you know, C, kind of what kind of situation you're in when you try to rebuild from the top up. Because if the more assets you stock, the more likely you're going to be able to contend for a longer time, whether it's using them to play or using them to buy. You know, there's so many different factors that go into this. So uh, mid-market teams, it's it's really hard. Um, and I don't know what baseball is going to have to do, but once the new collective bar- collective bargaining agreement is uh, worked on, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these mid-market and small market owners are going to have a lot more to say. Um, and and I, I can't imagine that maybe not this next collective bargaining agreement, but probably the next one, we're, we're going to have to start seeing a salary cap in baseball. You yeah, or think, some right? sort of luxury tax that's more spread out, more defined. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's maybe maybe what happens is, I know the Dodgers got all that kind of stupid money on their TV deal, but it really hasn't panned out for the, the company that paid it. Um, so maybe it's just kind of, uh, the market is going to correct itself because when other teams come due for their their TV contracts and radio contracts and such, that other teams are going to really evaluate it better and and not give out as much money as the Dodgers had where they could just sign whoever they want. Um, namely, the Cubs, when their TV deal is up, uh, you have to expect that uh, that's everybody is going to be watching that. Oh, yeah. Big time. Because that's really going to set the tone for the rest of baseball. Because if the Cubs get just astronomical money, then you're going to see the Red Sox and the Yankees and the Mets and the Cardinals all want these giant contracts with television. But if the Cubs are forced to uh, to deal with the repercussions of the Dodgers uh issues with um recuperation of the costs of that contract then it's going to set the tone for everybody else yeah absolutely um so going back to the brewers and going back to this series i want to talk about a little bit with you i have a one question i've been dying to ask you so i figured i'd just ask that now did you hear about the whole rain delay fiasco I was going to ask you, I, I heard that, um, is it the dance off or is this, uh, the, the brewers getting upset that the The brewers getting upset. I heard that they were upset, but I didn't hear anything more about it. Well, there were, let's see. I, there was, um, some Milwaukee beat reporter was talking about it. Um, kind of saying how the general manager thinks that it was canceled for a reason and they knew that it wasn't going to rain. There's now this whole conspiracy theory about how the Cubs cancel the game so they could get a day off and play this game again in June when it's warmer. Even though it was pretty warm yesterday, I will admit they could have easily played that game if you go based off of just rain because it didn't rain after like 1 o'clock. But when they called the game, the weather was terrible outside. It was pouring rain. I don't know what kind of condition the field was in, and a lot of the reports suggested that this was going to go on all day. So the Brewers were pretty pissed about it. I mean, I get it. Is comparatively Friday versus Saturday, it was a, it was like a you know completely different weather. Um, I mean, it was overcast, but the temperature was much warmer Saturday. Uh, it rained. I mean, at least in my house, it rained a little bit. Um, I'm just directly west of Wrigley Field by a couple of miles. Uh, rained here, but not hard. Not, not nothing like Friday. I, I I was shocked that the game got canceled and they played Friday. But uh, I mean, 
you really have to consider the fans here too um and the the schedule is you're not going to start doing a bunch of double headers you know you're not going to have a you're not going to have the fans make them multiple games have to sit out in the rain and and wait it out for rain delays um you're going to have to consider them and if the the game does get you know postponed is it's it's hard to reschedule you got to really consider a lot of these things i don't i don't think they they take it lightly or they go there was some mastermind plan of oh we'll we'll do much better in in june than we will in may that that's kind of stupid um yeah is number one is come the end you know end of the season i would be absolutely shocked if one game between the Brewers and the Cubs is going to be meaningful. And here's the thing. They're going to play that game eventually. It's not like they magically forfeited and gave the Cubs the win. They're going to play that game, just not that day. Yeah, just, you know, I get that you're hot and the Cubs are are struggling and you feel like you have the advantage right now and you want to you want to take them while the, the iron is hot, but you know don't be babies about it nobody's nobody's canceling it for that reason or else they would have canceled friday too yeah here's what uh the beat reporter said and this is what a lot of people are talking about brewers definitely think cubs postponed game yesterday for reason other than the weather comments coming from gm david stearns oh well like what do you uh, what do you make of that that's i think it's just asinine to be honest with you i think so too it's they're I don't, I'm not. I don't know who is the ultimate one that calls the game in the right. weather. Doesn't MLB have something to do with it? Well, I think this is what happens. The home team can call the game or postpone it before it happens. While when it's in a rain delay, uh, or when you're you're playing and they want to go to a rain delay, that's umpires' discretion. And then I think the umpires and MLB talk about the game going forward or not. Because it would be kind of silly to say, oh, we're winning past the fifth inning. We want to end it. Like, you know, that obviously they wouldn't take that into account. Um, so my understanding is the Cubs team kind of has the say of whether or not they can go on with the game or not. And uh, the home because they were the home team um, and the game hadn't started yet. And they postponed this thing like, oh, I'd say two hours before. But again, I was looking at the weather at the time. And what a lot of it indicated is that they said this was going to go on all day and that the room around 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock that they already said wouldn't rain when the game would start, that would end quickly. And that there'd be more storms. And even that was disputable. Even some other people were saying, no, this is going to be pretty continuous all day. I'm not a weatherman. I don't know for sure, but what benefit does it really have by saying, let's cancel this game and screw with the Brewers? Like, it doesn't really make sense to me. And they wouldn't want to cancel that day if they had to. They were giving away the final out bobblehead. That's kind of a big marketing thing right there. Yeah, I mean, I... I was mentioning to you before we started the show is that I was supposed to go camping this weekend, but the weather was too bad where we were going. And right. Um, and so instead we just did things around the city with my kid and we took her to the zoo, uh, the Lincoln park zoo. And we, we got trapped in one of the buildings cause it was just pouring. It was, right. It was pouring and we just, you know, I didn't want her to be out in the rain. Um, and so we had to wait it out in the, the uh the africa house so it was you know it's like this it wasn't like it was sunny outside it was it was raining i don't know what the field was like i don't i just it's it's so silly to think that this was something underhanded um you know when they're making up the game the game has to be played right that's exactly that's what i'm saying the game has to be played eventually I, I think it's just one of those things is, um, you know, sometimes general managers will just say things in public to to do some media jockeying. Um, I know, like, in the NBA, they'll do it where GMs and coaches will 
will make some statements and NFL as well. They'll make some statements because they want the league to hear it. So then they take notice. Um, so maybe he's just doing that where he's jockeying, where he's like, I don't like shenanigans and I want, I want the Cubs to be under scrutiny from MLB, uh, to make sure everything's on the up and up. But if that's not the case, even if that's the case, that's a little silly, but if that's not the case, I, it's just, it's just Bush league. Yeah. Um, now I did think about this. I know John Lackey and Chris Bazio had the whole indicating thing about uh, Thames being on steroids, and that was probably stupid on their part. So one thing I kind of thought of is, well, if you're going to say something like that, we'll say something like this. And the way I see it is, if that's the case, then you both got your jabs with each other. Now you can just forget about it. And I don't want to hear... The Brewers lost momentum because of yesterday, because the Cubs got rest. Well, you got rest too. Don't pull that. Both teams got rest. It wasn't a rain delay's fault yesterday that Chase Anderson was throwing meatballs over the heart of the plate and the Cubs were crushing it to kingdom come. It wasn't the rain delay's fault that Jake Arrieta was throwing nasty breaking stuff. Like, that's that whole thing is just silly. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Both teams need to knock off the BS. Uh, yeah. Because we don't need this to turn into another uh, on the field situation like Orioles and Red Sox. Well, you know, it's actually kind of funny when you think about it. I saw a tweet from a Brewers fan today, and I thought it was a fantastic tweet. This little rivalry is just childish bantering between each other, but it's like physically, it's completely harmless. While Baltimore and the Red Sox are trying to physically hurt each other so it's just kind of an interesting way of looking at both things where the Baltimore and the Red Sox that's that's going to be lingering for a long time this in my opinion I think the Brewers will leave town and it'll all be forgotten I really do hopefully that just you know you, you don't like as a Cubs fan uh, when you're you're playing a team that should be in a league below you I mean, that's not to knock the Brewers, but when you're the defending World Series champion and, and a team like the Brewers who was expected to be at the, the finish last in the division or, you know, close to, uh, you you hate seeing your name muddied with media barbs back and forth. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. It's not something you want to have to deal with, and... You know, the Cubs just want to try to win, and they want to try to keep doing what they're doing, and I'm really certain they don't want to be having little fits with the Milwaukee Brewers or any other team, really. But, you know, I, I again, I, I personally believe that this is going to boil over soon enough, and it's going to be, you know, whatever. Because if you saw that whole dancing thing the other day, and you saw the way the players play on the field... I don't think the Brewers and Cubs, the teams themselves, the Brewer, like the Brewers and the Cubs teams actually like hate each other. I just think it's kind of the organizations taking jabs at each other and it, it, it's silly and it needs to just be just flipped flipped away and not revisited because yeah, Chris Bazio and John Lackey probably didn't say smart things. You know, John Lackey is going to be John Lackey no matter what. And the Cubs didn't conspire for the rain delay because we've already heard plenty of conspiracy theories about Game 7 of the World Series last year. Those were completely stupid. Um, but, yeah, it's just there's no need for this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and, and it, I would have, as a fan, would have loved to have seen this be a three-game series because it, nothing really got resolved. We played two games, and it was uh, Brewers won – uh, an awful game on in bad conditions that probably shouldn't have gone on. Oh, that was bad, yeah. Um, and Saturday postponed, and then Cubs have a pretty good game on uh, today with uh, Ariette on the mound. But uh, you finally saw Hayward come back from his, was it a finger or thumb injury? Um, yep. They, they moved Zobrist into the leadoff position. Hit a leadoff bomb. Hit a leadoff bomb right off the bat. Uh, that's that just had to 
annoy uh, Joe Madden because he's been so adamant about um, Kyle Schwarber being the leadoff guy, and they and they move <laughs> Zobris in the leadoff spot, and they not only does he get a home run uh, in the leadoff spot, but the Cubs offense just catches fire. Yeah, um, you know what? I say if it works, it works. Keep it as it is. I think what we saw today, that lineup was the best lineup the Cubs put out all year. And you know what? It showed with the results. Uh, I was a big fan of Schwarber leading off, but you know what? I'm kind of digging Ben Zobris too. So if you have him, you have Schwarber too, Bryant, Rizzo, 3-4, and then you have Ian Happ in the lineup who's tearing the cover off the ball. That's something we haven't talked about yet is Ian Happ. We have not. Um, yeah, and so Ian Happ was actually next on my list of things to talk about is he's sort of been, uh, you know, we, we've we jokingly talked about, you know, semi-serious, semi-jokingly about how Avi Garcia is the entire engine of the White Sox offense. Um, and you have Ian Happ who comes up to from the minors to the Cubs organization, and he has been nothing short of, of excellent uh, in this small sample size, but he, along with uh, Bryant, have has come alive during this time. I mean, it's not like he was really struggling, but uh, he's looking like he, the MVP. Yeah, he's he's gone. He's you know stepped it up to that MVP type level. And between the two of them, they've been the catalyst that's behind the Cubs' offense because the you know you look at the numbers and for the most part, everybody else is still struggling uh, numbers wise. Yeah, I mean, mainly the starters. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right. Uh, the thing that impresses me the most about Ian Happ is his patience. His patience looks phenomenal. You see a lot of rookies come up to the big leagues and they're swinging away at everything they can. Happ has been the definition of patient. He is getting into full counts. He's getting to three ball counts. He's taking walks. And when he gets a pitch to hit, he swings and he hits it. Yeah, I mean, he you're right. He looks, he up there has the same just calmness and even keeledness like you would see from Kirby Puckett or Tony Gwynn. And not comparing him to you know, two of the best hitters ever in baseball, but just the manner of when they're up there, they, they feel supreme confidence. Nothing is rattling him. Doesn't matter the count. They're in control, and he really looks like a vet, like a you know, not just a veteran, but a you know, a, an exceptional veteran in that respect. Yeah, and you know, you see him at the plate mostly because when you think about it, yeah, he's been playing out in the field, but it's weird. It seems like the ball's never hit in his direction. Yeah, and it's been weird because. Uh, you know, I, I've seen I've seen a bit of him in the minors uh, playing second base, and he's not a really good spe- second baseman. And when they no, he's they not. Him, when they brought him up, they're playing him in center, and I'm like, ooh, he, ooh. and he's been okay. <laughs> I, I mean, but you know, you you alluded to it earlier. Is that overall? I mean, the Cubs' defense as a whole has been pretty bad, uh, and other than than uh, Jason Hayward, who's just he makes he makes everything look easy out in the outfield. Yep, uh, and his throws than, that are just darts looks effortless. Yeah, I mean, if if you look at new like uh, statistically, just the the amount of ground he covers um, compared to other players, it just you just realize how superior of a defensive player he is. And if you look at statistically. Uh, you know, by the metrics, is Kyle Schwarber is a terrible left fielder. You know, it's funny. He'll make some really, really good catches like we saw the other day. And then he'll kind of boot a routine play. It's just, there's no real consistency. Yeah, and I mean, the thing, the big thing for me is not so much if he bobbles a ball or he misses a cutoff throw or things like that because those are you know those are 
mistakes you see a guy that hasn't played that many times in the outfield and is coming off an entire missed season. Those are the things they do. But for me, it's just the, the initial instinct when the ball hits the the bat hits the ball because he he will take a step in when the ball is clearly going to go over his head and he's right. running for it, or he backs up on one that he's going to have to run in for. It's just his initial instinct when that ball is hit, he doesn't have it. Uh, I mean, if you could if you could superimpose or like Jason Hayward and Kyle Schwarber with balls hit, you know, similarly to their respective, you know, fields and the difference in the way they field it, I think that would just be uh, something huge for for people to see to open up their eyes of of how not good of a fielder Schwarber is. But the thing is, is left field is one of, is probably the position when you can do some of the least damage as far right. as bad fielder. You can mask that a lot. Um, yes, especially when you had Hayward and Wright and Almora in center. Is those those two guys is. You know, you could always shade over Almora to the left because you know Hayward can cover a lot of ground and um, and Almora can can may take up a lot of the slack. But when you have Ian Happ, you know, going back, to, circling back to Ian Happ, is when mm-hmm. you put Ian Happ in center, he's not defensively, he's not Albert Almora. No, 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 no. Uh, so you lose that little bit of protection and padding that you had uh, for Schwarber, and it it exposes him a little more. That's absolutely right. That is absolutely right. And they want Hap's bat in every day, and we've seen the flashes of greatness from Albert Elmore Jr. as well. It just goes back to one of those things where the Cubs have so many of these guys, it's hard to put them somewhere because... The other day, when they were talking about who's going to be sent down because they're going to want to keep Hap, and that was the case, and they ended up sending Tommy LaStella down. And Tommy LaStella has been playing great so far. Yeah, that, that was a really tough decision. And I, the, the right decision was sending down Tommy LaStella. And it's hopefully, uh, I mean, last year when he went down, there was a debacle. But hopefully this time, he understood that it was nothing yeah. he did wrong. It was a... You know, we we've got to ride the hot hand because Tommy Lastella has been just a different guy this year. He has been uh, everything the Cubs have needed. You know, coming in and and being a pinch hitter, uh, whatever they've needed, he's he's been solid and he's done it the way they've asked him to do it. Absolutely, and you almost ask yourself if they want to keep Ian Happ around and like. Not saying like another week or another few days. I mean, really keep him around. Would you almost be tempted to trade him? Like yeah. they did with Caesar? But you also want the depth as well. So that's why I'm kind of going back and forth on this whole thing. It's, you know, it's one of those things is um, I, when you, if you think about all these players as if it's a video game or if they're robots, then it doesn't matter who you have as your roster, you know, it's just, well, we put the best guys out there. But in real life is there are certain guys that don't like coming off the bench. They don't like it. Right. They don't do as well. They're not comfortable. Uh, it's the same reason why a guy who's a phenomenal hitter, if you take him out of a place in the in the batting order that he's comfortable in and put him in somewhere he's not comfortable, you get terrible results. Uh, it, it's it's you know these are human beings and you have to kind of factor that in and a guy who sits on the bench all game long doesn't play the field uh, it's it's a it takes a different mental preparation to just come right off the bat of the bench cold and come in there and bat at a critical moment and Tommy Lastella has been great at that so sure you can say all right Ian Happ is a better player than Tommy Lastella and no one will argue that but to say, well, you know, trade away Tommy Lastella because he has no role. Uh, it's another. That's a. That's another conversation, and uh, eventually, the hand is going to get forced. But um, it, it's a tough decision because 
you think about, you know, how many times have, you know, World Series come down to an unlikely hero, and having a guy coming off the bench to that that can play well is is huge, especially when you're playing in a National League city where you the pitcher bats. Right. Yeah. Very good point. That's kind of why I'm so back and forth on this. I think right now they don't trade him. You want to keep him. Because, you know, also there have been a lot of nagging injuries. So as soon as someone gets hurt, Tommy LaSalle will be right back up. Heck, he might even be right back up if they make another up-and-down transaction that involves maybe a pitcher or something, whether it's the bullpen or whatever. Uh, so I don't think he'll be down there very long. Uh, again, it's really hard to kind of place everyone right now because you want to give Albert Almora some time, but right now there really isn't any room because Ian Happ is trying to play center because you want his bat in there every day. So you're juggling around so many things. It, it sounds kind of bad, but it was easier to do this lineup juggle when there were a lot of guys hurt because it's like, okay, you just plug in this guy, this guy, this guy for Hayward who's hurt and Zobrist who's hurt and, you know, easy peasy. And now it's just... Uh, it's a little more difficult than that. And this is already, like, a little less... Well, I shouldn't say, because when they traded Caesar, it was before Hap was up. So I guess it does make it a little more difficult now. But it goes to show that a guy that they really valued, like Caesar, they had to trade him away because there really was no room on the team. We traded Soler away. There was no room for him. And luckily, we got probably the best closer in baseball in exchange for it. Yeah, and... Uh, I mean, if you ask Joe Madden about it right now, I guarantee you the answer he'll give is, well, you know, the, the universe has its way of working these things out is, and and it's as much as it's hippy dippy the way he says it, it is it is kind of true that uh, right, it's a long season is maybe maybe Ian Happ hits a wall, and which is I'm sure is going to happen at some point, especially as a rookie, wall. yeah, he's going to hit a wall, and you, you know, do you let him struggle? up in the majors do you send him back down to get more at bats uh those are things that make it easier to decide um uh you know maybe maybe somebody gets injured hopefully not but maybe somebody gets injured and that that sort of works itself out um maybe a trade opens up where they have to trade ian happ or javi Baez uh for starting pitching and that is the answer to it there's there's any number of things that can happen over the next several months that that can you know make the situation figure out. But Tommy Listella is uh, you know you hope you don't get you don't trade him because you're not going to get much for him and right. he's, he's a valuable commodity. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another thing a lot of people are talking about is the trade potentials. A lot of people seem to want to be on the Baez trade train when a few months ago they were all, we love Baez, never trade him, yada, yada, yada. I feel like the Cubs' opinion on Baez when it comes to their fans is a roller coaster. One week he's a hero and everyone loves him. The next week he strikes out too much, he can't hit, and uh, he's too energetic according to a very few amount. But you, you get what I mean. Yeah, I mean, that's been the thing I've been talking to people about recently uh my take on it is um I, i've sort of switched camps a little bit about who i would like the the cubs to trade myself but it has nothing to do with uh, snap decisions uh it's and it has nothing to do with losing faith in the player or not liking the player or or anything like that it's uh i've moved more to the trading Javi Baez camp solely for the reason that uh, I think you can get more in a trade for him because he actually has major league talent and he's a major league ready player. Whereas we don't know if Ian Happ, this is just a you know bump from a guy coming up and he's going to plateau. Uh, I, I just think you can get more in a trade for Javi Baez and that's my thinking on it. But I get what you're saying. Um, I, I just, I don't, I don't go into a trade lightly with any of these guys. Is right. any of these guys I think are very talented baseball players that you would love to have on your team. So for me, it's sort of agonizing to trade any of them. Uh, but the reality is, is 
there's there's only so many spots and you need more pitching yeah absolutely there's no doubt they're gonna have to worry about pitching for the future and you know there's a lot of rumors and talks and opinions saying that they will go all out for a big pitcher because the market really isn't available when we got john lester that was one of the best ace pitching markets that we've seen in a while there was max scherzer there was john lester there was david price and count for what it's worth he's not really that anymore but at the time james shields was still really good yeah, so james that was shields, a yeah james shields was uh was one of the heavy hot and heavy names yeah absolutely he was right up there with scherzer and lester and david price like that was a great market you're not going to see that market anymore i mean because think about it a lot of those big guys have signed on these big deals and by the time they're available again they'll be pretty much done with their careers so you know put that in perspective so it's gonna have to be a trade if you're gonna want something big and established and that's where some things may get a little more difficult you know look at javier baez do you want to get rid of that energy and defense ian happ do you think that he's worth a lot and you would be willing to part with him and look at some of the guys in the minors eloy jimenez is an absolute stud prospect Jamie or Canelario, I'm a little iffy on. I know his sample size in the big leagues is very small, but I'll be honest with you, I'm not terribly high on him. I think he's great at crushing pitching that's either triple A or like how many times has he just gone off pitching in spring training off guys who are now selling used tires? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, maybe, maybe he does have value. I don't know. It's a small sample size in the big leagues, but, you know, it, it hasn't been good so far. Yeah, and I'm just pulling up the list of, of pitchers that are, are starting pitchers that are going to be available uh, after this season. Um, Brett mm -hmm. Anderson, Jake Arrieta, Clay Buckholz, um, depend Madison Bumgarner, Garner could be, but there's a club option for him. Um, but I would imagine they would pick that up unless <laughs> unless there's something sinister going on in the, the show. Well, 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 well. That whole dirt bike incident was kind of... But still, I don't think that's going to... I'm uh, just saying. Trevor Cahill, uh, Matt Kane, Andrew Kashner, uh, Tyler Chatwood, Jesse Chavez, Chewin... Wei Yin Chen, Alex Cobb, Bartolo Colon, Johnny Cueto, Yu Darvish, John Danks, uh, R. A. Dickey, uh, Scott Feldman, uh, Derek Holland, Miguel Gonzalez. I, this list is not very good. Um, Matt Moore, but there's a club option on him. Um, Tyson Ross, CC Sabathia, Anibal Sanchez, Ooh. Uh, Masahiro Tanaka could not opt out of the remaining three years of his contract. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, and yeah, Jared Weaver. <laughs> oh god. So yeah, you there's not not much there as far as as free agents so you know you you almost have to part with a guy because um i mean who's your best option you darvish and he's he's 31 right now and injury prone you don't really see a lot of aces that you know are going to be controllable for a while or reliable for a while i will say i am in alex cobb he intrigues me. He is actually a pretty underrated pitcher. You look at his career numbers in the past few years, if you take away the season he was injured, he's been pretty good. Is he your number one ace? No, but if they signed him to be like a number three, that's one guy on that list I actually think Theo should go after. Other than that, it's a lot of has-beens. It's a lot of guys who are fifth starters at best. It's a lot of guys who are pretty much innings eaters, and you're not really looking for that kind of thing. You're looking to fill in your rotation because some guys are not going to be there next year. Jake is probably going to take some money somewhere else. John Lackey is going to be retired. 
Uh, John Lester is still a good pitcher, but, you know, he's climbing up there in years. Who knows what's going to happen with the five spot going forward. So, you know, they're going to ha- they're gonna make a trade. I'm pretty confident to that. But, you know, I will say I would like to see them go after Alex Cobb. But that's, that's a discussion for another time. Yeah, uh, so it's... You know, one of these guys is going to have to go, and it's it's not going to be an easy decision. Uh, and my thinking is just that a guy who is not a prospect, who you know what he can do in the majors. I mean, you saw him in the playoffs uh, in Javi Baez. You saw him in the World Baseball Classic. You you know what you're getting. It's a it's a a much more known commodity than with Heimer Candelaria or Ian Happ. Um, it's it's you know much more what you're getting, so you're probably going to get more of a return. Right, and if we're gonna give up talent like that, that's established, we better be getting like a Chris Archer, or we better be getting someone of note. Like I don't want to give that up for like a. Do you remember the rumor when they traded Javi Baez for Shelby Miller? Like, don't do anything like that. <laughs> oh, that would have been bad. Do you remember that rumor? Yeah. Gordon Wittenmeyer tweeted that. Yep. And I you know, I was I was in the hot and heavy for Shelby Miller trade uh camp, but that he he uh he bottomed out. But I did hear an interesting rumor and I would be shocked if this ha- would happen. Um but uh the rumor is that the Cubs would take on the rest of the salary of what's his face from the um, the Diamondbacks. Uh, Shelby Miller? No. Uh, the guy that got Rob- the Dodgers. Granky? Yeah. You heard a rumor about that? Yeah. And I can't remember where I heard this. But it, it was it was from it was from a, a source that uh that Arizona just wanted to dump that salary. And wow. So it was it was on one of the forums, but it was it was like, a, it was from somebody who like doesn't spread weird rumors. That it was, so I don't know where this the pulse was, but I've 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 read this and I was like, I'm I'm intrigued. Well, I mean, there's a few things to know about Zach Ranky. He's getting a lot of money in Arizona, and he's also. As good as he is, he's not a spring chicken either. He's been around a long time. I just, uh, I'm gonna look at his age right now. Um, I mean, there's, there's no doubt he's still really, really good. He's 33 but right now. 33. Okay. Um, yeah, I. That's a really interesting rumor that I didn't really hear. Um, yeah. He's been pitching since 2004. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, last year he had a rough season, but uh, yeah, I mean this. I mean that, that happens with you know when you are sign a big contract and you go to a new city. Those types of things happen. Look at Lester. Look at Hayward. Um, but this year he's uh, he's not pitching bad. He's got a one whip. Uh, that's not bad. He's got a FIP of 3.35. Um, I, I mean, so he's his ERA is a 3.09. That's those are pretty solid numbers. Yeah, he's he's doing very well this season, and the Diamondbacks pitching that was bad this uh, last year is doing very well this season. So you got to give it to them. I just when exactly did you hear this rumor? I'm just I'm just curious. Uh, I would say about a week and a half ago. Huh. I'm gonna have to look into it, but yeah, uh, interesting, very interesting. Um, I, I think at this point, Theo is kind of looking at all options right now, whether it's trades, signings, or whatever. I think that you're at the point in the season right now where you kind of evaluate where you are, and you evaluate what you have, and you evaluate what you want to give up, and you evaluate what you absolutely need. So I think that there's a lot of uh, talks going on right now, just as talks, just as things to kind of go through each scenario, because 
you know, it's a while from the trade deadline, but it's going to come up on you soon, and you're well into the season enough where you could see some glaring holes and strengths, whether it's what you're going to give up, what you have, and what you don't have. So, you know, maybe they're just kind of looking over every possible scenario right now. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you're Arizona, I, I don't I don't watch a lot of the NL West baseball unless they're playing the Cubs just because of the time difference and things. But uh they're they're still right in there, two games out of first place. Um Yep, playing, they are. They're playing, playing great. Well. But you also have to think about is if you're able to trade him for a major league ready prospect uh, and get away from that contract that's going to be an albatross come a couple of years because Arizona is not a big market team, um, that they do have financial constraints, that they're going to get hit by that contract. If you can move him and get a major league ready piece where you can still compete this season, I, who knows? I, we'll, we'll see. It's going to be, you're going to see a lot of interesting things fly around and, um, and sometimes they're, they come from legitimate sources, even if they're not real, because people are throwing throwing sense. Right. They're throwing things out there. Sometimes things are misheard or there's information that's not interpreted properly. Because, I mean, look at the past few years. There's been so many talks over and over about rumoring trade negotiations or at least kind of discussions between the Cubs and the White Sox and Chris Sale and Quintana and basically what it sounded like from Theo Epstein was Theo and Han talked for like 30 seconds and they laughed at each other, joked with each other, then hung up the phone because there was a proposal of who wanted what, whether it was Han wanted a lot from the Cubs or Theo wanted to give too little for Quintana, I don't think is really known, but it's pretty obvious that they were really far apart and just kind of ended that whole thing but you know there's still a lot of rumors that go around about the possibility of that kind of stuff so it's just stuff you're going to hear about whether it's legit or not or whether it's misinterpreted or not or whether it's just kind of an idea floating around yeah i mean or things just thrown out there to because they know people will run with it to to create a false uh, narrative that they want out there Um, and that could fool with the market too that can make other teams want to try to up the ante a little bit you know the power of those kind of things is kind of underrated and we'll into uh to tease this forward we'll talk about this kind of situation a little bit later in another sport um and uh the last two things i want to talk about the cubs is just briefly is you know i think a lot of people were very hopeful about what we would have with eddie butler uh hoping that he could be that answer in that fifth starter spot Um, and I mean, I still don't think we have enough sample size because that first start was really great, but you always see, or you see a lot of times where first time pitchers where nobody's seen them before they get a bump from that because, uh, you you know, you don't know what he's throwing. Um, and then this game was just bad weather against a, a really good hitting team. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I am less optimistic, though, I think. Um, I, I don't think he's going to be the answer. Uh, I don't think the Cubs are that lucky. <laughs> They're going to just have um, a guy come out of the blue and, and fill that hole. But that's not to say I don't, I, I'm don't. i not excited for him in the future long term. Yeah, I know what you mean. Kind of my opinion on him is, again, haven't seen enough, so it's hard to have a complete opinion. But I also think to myself, maybe it's not the long-term answer or the holy answer, but maybe it's at least enough to sustain a spot and at least sustain something that's, I mean, this isn't saying much better than Brett Anderson because it's hard to be much worse, but, you know, maybe it is kind of a short-term semi-solution. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's better. Or maybe it's not at all. But that's kind of how I see it right now. Uh, He pitched in really bad weather against a really good hitting team. Uh, Really cold that day. er, Rainy, wet. So the conditions weren't ideal. But I'm going to give him a few more starts and see where it goes. I mean, the thing also to consider is if this was in the middle of the season or later part of the season, 
you don't night make a move because it doesn't matter. Once you make the playoffs, you were going to go to a four four man rotation anyway. Right. And, and we Jason all know Hamill. who's going to be in that four man rotation. Yeah, and as Jason, of now, Jason Hamill had a very good year last year statistically over the whole season. Uh and they just left him off the the roster. Um so if this was later in the season, you'd be like, "Okay, you you sort of know where you stand. We just need somebody that competent out there to not get blown out." Um, but we're still in the early parts of the season. Uh, so you're right. They, they sort of have to wait and see a little bit with him, but, um, you can't, you can't wait too long because we're, we're at the end of May. Uh, trade deadline is, is going to be here before you know it. And you sort of have to start evaluating if you need to trade for somebody, um, what you want to give up and, uh, where, where you project this kid. Right, yeah, you can't wait around a whole season, that's for sure. Uh, you know, maybe see what he does in the next two, three starts. I think that's what I'm really curious of. And, you know, you look as of right now, unless there's a trade, unless there's a big blockbuster, you kind of know which guys would be in your potential postseason rotation. And though I'm fairly confident the Cubs are going to be in the postseason, there's always the little part that says you don't know for sure, so... You know, this is scenarios if everything goes as planned and they're in the postseason, as I feel they will be. But you kind of know your guys are going to be Lester and then Hendricks and Arietta and Lackey. Again, maybe there's a trade. Maybe something happens to one of them with an injury. But you kind of have an idea. So they want to find the best alternatives as, as part of that. Um, and we'll see if Eddie Butler can be one of those guys. And the last thing I wanted to talk about with the Cubs was, and I know I'm going to get a earful from people about this, but I think most Cubs fans have had this uh, thought process of what's going on with Jake Arrieta? Why doesn't he look like Jake Arrieta? And I'm starting to say, at what point do we stop saying, well, why doesn't he look like Jake Arrieta? And we say, was 2015 an anomaly and what we're seeing is Jake Arrieta and we were just looking at him through a wrong lens for the last couple seasons well that's interesting to bring up um the thing I would say is Jake Arrieta was very good in 2014 as well he was very very good that year and he was good when he came up with the Cubs he came over to the Cubs he worked a little bit in the minor leagues came up was really good in the last little stretch really good in 2014 won the Cy Young the next year so you know I want to really establish the fact that it wasn't just one year it was multiple but with that being said it seems like you know, this days in Baltimore, it was four years. We've seen inconsistencies within the last year. So it's almost like five not-so-great years compared to, th like, two and a half really good years. But even so, Jake Area he still has good stuff. You can see he still has good stuff. The breaker he was having today, phenomenal. The changeup he had today, phenomenal. The movement he puts on his pitches, phenomenal. Um, you know... It's hard for me to say, but I think truly that one of the things up with him is there's a change in mechanics and a change in approach that he has talked about that just aren't working as well. At the same time, I also think there's just a, a whole idea of adjustments from other players. I think people have figured him out a little bit. So it for me, it's really kind of hard to say, but it is an interesting thing to bring up. Yeah, and it's funny because I wrote... I, mean, I was taking notes on this on Friday and and then after today's game I was like well I don't know maybe I shouldn't bring this up but I, you know one start where he looks phenomenal it's does that negate the you know a lot of the inconsistencies that we've seen over the past you know however many starts uh, and you're right it's and every it seems like every outing is a different problem so you wonder what the what the deal is is i know there was a precipitous drop in the fastball velocity but you know was is a two mile an hour drop in the fastball velocity 
enough to do this. Uh, you also know he's not the his control isn't as pr great as it was in um, 2015 and 2014, where he was hitting all the corners and causing people to you know he was ahead in the count, uh, made guys be more defensive at the plate and really having and then being able to throw a nasty out pitch and that's what you saw is is hit the corners get ahead of the count and then throw a nasty out pitch and now it's guys are hitting him and he's not getting to that point and is uh he's either throwing a lot of things over the the middle that are getting hit or he's really struggling on the outside and uh, he's behind in the count and where the the batter has the the upper hand, um, so it's it's been a lot of different things that you've seen from Jake Arrieta, and today so you saw flashes back to how good he was a couple years ago. Right, exactly, and like you like I said, and like what you said, there's a lot of factors that go into it. One thing that I think is really interesting that someone brought up, uh, someone was talking about this. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's just a thought. I'm not saying it is or isn't, but someone brought up all those innings he pitched in 2015. Ridiculous number of innings. Well over 200 innings. Plus, you know, some deep ball games to start 2016. Is it at all possible that that is just flat out taking a toll on him? Physically. It's possible. But I mean, did he? I don't think he even hit 200 innings last year before the playoffs. Well, I, I'm saying from 2015. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's possible. Uh, every guy has uh, the one thing that makes me question that whether that's is just the way he takes care of his body. But you know, even if you're in good shape, is there's only there's only so many pitches your shoulder has. Right. And yeah, some guys and are built for the grind. You look at Nolan Ryan and, and Roger Clemens pitched for combined like 8 million years uh, and were just able to throw flamer after flamer no matter how old they were. But not everybody well, They were freaks is, in nature. Yeah, not Absolute freaks in nature. Yeah, but not everybody is like that. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a legit possibility. Right. And, you know, also keep in mind, he's not young. He's not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's he's in his mid thirties. Uh, he's not old per se, but he's in that weird age of a pitcher where they could be this same level for another five years, or they could have a precipitous drop off in another year. They're in that awkward age that you don't know because there's some guys that this is they they'll they'll maintain their peak for you know, right through the, their mid thirties into their late thirties. Uh, and then you have guys that just boom, done. They're done. Right. And you know and, what I'm going to say though? It, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say is CC Sabathia is a guy who just had a precipitous drop off. Yeah. Oh, Remember Johan, when he was with the Brewers? Yeah. Johan Santana is another guy. I mean, his was injury wise, but he was another guy mm -hmm. that, was looked like a, he was going to be a Hall of Famer and then just boom, done. Look at, um, okay, maybe this isn't the greatest example. Um, John Garland on the White Sox. Like, remember he had his prime years when they won the World Series and then other than that, it was just kind of eh? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I know it's not the greatest example of what you're saying, but do you kind of get what I'm saying with him? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, you never, I mean, you never know. And that's the risk of, you know, when you sign a guy in his, his late twenties is you expect him to be able to pitch well into, you know, the age 32, age 33, you expect that, uh, batters, you know, batters, hitters, you should be, that should be the end of their prime and you expect them to be able to play through that. But it's those years after is you don't, it's a crapshoot. Uh, and that's a big part of what the Cubs don't want is that's, is they could have signed Jake Arrieta to a con, uh, contract extension. Is it was one of the rare uh, 
times that uh, um, Scott Boris was willing to do a, an extension before the contract expired because he knew what he would be up against with Jake Arrieta going to term because of the late start he got and his age when he would be a free agent. And I think they could have gotten a deal done that would have been fair to both sides, but the Cubs weren't willing to go into age 37, 38, 39. They only wanted a shorter window deal and La, 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 Arietta wanted a much longer deal. Yeah, I mean, he wanted a lot of money, and maybe he's looking back at that and regretting it right now. What I'm going to say overall about Jake Arietta is, my first of all, my theory on the struggles, I think it's all a mechanical thing. They're trying to do something different with him, or he's trying to do something different, and it's not really working, combined with some players just kind of figuring it out. But I think at the end of the day with Jake Arietta, at the very least, he helped bring us a World Series. And he gave us a Cy Young season. So, if he's not a Cub, which it looks like he won't be after this year, and maybe things don't end that great with him, at least we had that. You can't say it wasn't worth it in the end, or it was a one-year meaningless fluke he did help us win a World Series because last year in the postseason, he was pretty solid. He wasn't amazing, but he was pretty solid. Yeah, and the, the, the better thing about it is it's not like they signed him. You know, if they would have given him like a Lester-like contract to bring him to the Cubs, right? Uh, it's it's it could be a much different conversation, but they brought him over here as, a, as an add-on in a trade for where they gave up basically nothing and and they brought in a guy who helped them win a World Series and won a Cy Young. Right, uh, you gave him a garbage catcher and a mediocre starting pitcher. Yeah, and you brought in that. So it's it really changes the frame that you look at at the player because you got him for next to nothing. And sure he got arbitration uh out of it and he got paid, you know, was he getting 16 million this year, which is not you know, it's for the type of pitcher he is, it's low, but that's a darn lot of money. Um, yeah. So he's you you paid fairly well for him, and but he's you didn't give up a lot for him. He was a guy that you brought over for nothing. It changes the frame that you look at him, and you no matter what happens at the end of this year, uh, you you have to look fondly back at that because of of the pitcher you got and the World Series you got. Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel about a role this Chapman. Was he a good teammate? No. Was he a particularly good guy? No. But uh, though we gave up a pretty darn good prospect for him and the Yankees just got him right back, we got the World Series. So it was worth it. Yeah, World Series is worth a lot. Indeed um, they are. Uh, so let's you know quickly go through the White Sox. Uh, <laughs> roller coasters there for the, during the week. No um, kidding. They, they had two series against uh, or this week, one against the Angels, one against the Mariners. Neither one of them very good teams. Uh, but the Angels came in and, and just beat the, the White Sox like rented mules. Um, I mean, the scores weren't that bad, but it just, uh, you know, the, the starting pitching for the White Sox was not very good. And um, they... they it was embarrassing losses, more, more or less. I mean, the Tuesday was a walk off in the eleventh, um, and the Wednesday game, the White Sox were up four nothing in that game, and uh, then they lost twelve to eight. And that's just that's just a tough one to to face when when you had a pretty sizable lead on a bad team. The White Sox are really strange. They will have one week where they play pretty well. They will have another week where they play terribly. They will have a week where the pitching looks solid. They'll have a week where the pitching is getting shelled. They'll have a week where the offense is scoring runs, like the past two days. And then they'll have a week where they couldn't hit water if they fell out of a boat. All in all, if you look at the White Sox record, 20 and 22, two games below 500. I say it again. It's not good, 
but I think for their benefit this year, they need to get worse. Yeah. I was talking with my buddy, the one who's a White Sox fan, season ticket holder, and he swears up and down that they need to get rid of Todd Frazier. And um, they absolutely do, but they need to get rid of a lot of guys. Um, but right. The, Avi Garcia, and it's we keep saying it is he's a big part of why the the White Sox are so good. Is um, he's unreal? Is is when he hits the team hits for the most part. Uh, right. Is today's game was the first game I I could remember, and I've gone back on notes for several weeks, and it's the first game I can remember where they scored a bunch of runs, and Avi Garcia wasn't involved in any of them. In any like wasn't hitting, didn't wasn't the catalyst for it. Uh, Avi Garcia, I believe, was over today, and they scored eight runs. But for the most part, he has been the catalyst, and you have to really, if you're Rick Hahn, you have to take you have to take that hard look right now, because if he is not going to be a part of your team going forward, you need to part ways with him while the the, the getting's good, and make a big trade for him, get something for him that you can use. Otherwise, he's just going to buoy this team, and you're going to wind up with a much worse draft pick. And you need more draft picks if you're the White Sox during this rebuild. Yeah, which is kind of an interesting thing, because when they got him, he was intended to be part of the White Sox future, but that really hasn't worked out. So I can't help but ask, what are their plans with him? Because it seems like it's pretty unclear. There have been literally no trade rumors whatsoever with Avi Garcia, but it also sounds like from what people are saying that he's not really in their long-term plans. So I guess my question is, what is it? Is Rick Hahn kind of, you know, secretly not really being shown by the media making trade offers for Avi Garcia and teams just aren't taking it, thinking that he's just kind of a flash in the pan right now? Are they not making any offers or... Are they not sure what to do with him? I just don't know. I just yeah. really don't know. I don't know. And it's and it's interesting because you don't hear a lot of talk about it, but it's it's one of those situations where they got to poop or get off the pot with him is if he's going to be a long-term part of this future and they really think and they're fully confident in the fact that Avi Garcia has finally figured it out and is going to be the player they always thought he was going to be, they need to lock him up in a contract. And if they think that he's a flash in the pan and that this is not long term, then they need to trade him because he's buoying this team and he's holding their record at a respectable right around 500. And maybe that's part of the whole issue is that they don't really know what Avisail Garcia is. They don't know if he's going to keep this up, if he's going to completely tank, or maybe he's finally found his niche. I think truthfully... They don't know that because keep in mind, Garcia is still fairly young. He's not very old. Is he 24, 25? Uh, something around there, like mid 20s. Yeah. yeah, so, he's, so yeah, he's, maybe they just don't know. And it's it's one of the things you got to figure out because if, you know, if he's, you don't think, you don't believe in him or you don't see him as your long term future, the earlier you can trade him, the better it is for you to get this good draft pick. Uh, and, you know he's been a huge part of all all of these these wins for the most part. Uh, but this week, you know, you were saying that some weeks you have great play and some weeks you have bad play. And this week you had both. Is it was not good play against the Angels. Uh, your pitching performances weren't great. Um, you know, Pelfrey had a bad start. Holland had a mass start. Uh, but then you had a or uh, Gonzalez with a really poor start. Um, you know, you, you get swept by the angels, uh, Dave Robertson gives up two runs in, uh, you know, to blow a save, uh, that you ultimately lose in the 11th. That's got to hurt the trade, you know, possibly hurt his trade value. Um, it's, that's not good. But then you have the Mariners where sure you lose the first game five to four on a walk off, but, uh, Quintana comes and pitches amazing in game the game two of that series, and then games three. He and pitches four, like Quintana. Yeah, in games three and four of, it is funny. It was a total Quintana game. Is he pitched great, and they only got two runs of support. Exactly. Uh, exactly. But then Saturday and Sunday games, the bats came alive and they scored twenty four runs in two games. 
Right. It's just, it's very strange. It really is. Here's a discussion I want to have with you really quickly about a certain piece that they are looking to deal. And be honest. Do you think David Robertson is as value as some people think he is? Because I have had several Sox people tell me that he isn't. And some people who are not White Sox fans tell me that he is. I kind of wanted to get your opinion on that. I, my, here's my opinion. Is he a an elite guy? Is he a Mariano Rivera? Is he a Wade Davis? Is he in a role as Chapman? No. But no. is is he a very good closer um, historically? Yes. And I wouldn't give up a huge prospect piece for him, but... Here's the here's the situation. The team that needs him the most and is the most desperate need, I mean, you know, dire situation for a closer and is a team that could very well win the World Series is a team that has a bad taste in their mouth trading with the White Sox. And that's the Washington Nationals. Exactly. And it other... This is one of those things is where a team like fans love when their team fleeces somebody else in a trade. But here's one of those situations where it could come back and bite you is sure. You fleeced the nationals uh, when you made that Adam Eaton deal. And they not only is he hurt now, but you, they fleeced the nationals is you've got to think that the nationals are going to, you know, remember that much more than any fan uh, and, and do do they decide to not trade with the White Sox anymore? Uh, even though Dave Robertson would be a, a great piece for them going forward. Right, exactly. Right now what I've done is I've pulled up uh, top closers, the report, whether it's saves or ERA. I'm looking at their numbers right now, and I'm kind of looking at who they are and kind of what team they're on. Because you look at a lot of the top closers, they're on contending teams. Now, you look at some of the non-contending teams, and you look at their closers, and you say, okay, who's good? Who is going to be up for grabs at the trade market, at the trade deadline? And who are the contending teams that are going to probably need a closer? Granted, that can change with injuries and whatnot, but the team, like you said, the Nationals is really the main one that I can think of that needs an established closer. They absolutely need one, and they're going to go after one. And when you look at some of the top ones here, Greg Holland on the Rockies, right now they don't look like sellers. Craig Kimbrell, Red Sox, they're not going to be sellers. Cody Allen, Indians, they're not going to be sellers. Um... Brandon Kinsler is one on the Twins that is doing very well and not really getting a lot of attention. I don't think they're going to be buyers when it's all said and done. Uh, so that's one. Kelvin Herrera, uh, not doing very good, but sometimes some people were interested in them, but that's probably not going to be the case now. So, you know, David Robertson is one of the most notable guys out there. So I think he will generate some interest and he will be traded. Just the question for me is what will they get in return, potentially? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is the White Sox, they, they on one hand, it's great because they have several guys that they can flip and they're definitely going to be sellers. Uh, I mean, even if even if they're hanging around the lead, they're they're this isn't Kenny Williams where he's going to do a flip flop in the mid and be like, uh, we're, we were going to tank, but now we're going to trade for some overaged, you know, home run hitter that strikes out too many times. This is Rick Hahn running the show. And he's, he's, you know, he's going to trade all of these expiring contracts. Uh, and he, he one hand is great because they have these assets where they can at least get something for them uh, from teams that are in the run. But it's the the market also knows that the White Sox have to flip these guys or lose them for nothing. Um, so it's it's going to be how Recon plays this. And I think uh, you know Todd Frazier is going to be a tough sell for somebody unless unless a, a contending team has an injury 
of their third baseman or DH. Only- yeah, I mean, right now, if I'm a team, I'm not going to be going out a lot for Todd Frazier. Yeah, that's that's going to be a tough one. I thought that might be a, I thought that might be a, a possibility, but you know, he's really pooping the bed at the plates. Either you know, he's really pulling the the Pete Incaviglia type role with home runner or strikeout. Um, I, it, that's going to be a tough sell. Um, Dave Robertson, some of the starting pitching possibilities. But Dave Robertson is, is you're looking like your best option of, of making a trade, and uh, and that Nats trade partner is is got to be a tough one to to make the sell of of being able to fleece them twice. Is right, right. I mean, I guess it also depends on how desperate they get. But yeah, you're definitely right about that. And obviously, Quintana is their most valuable asset. But uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen with him. Yeah, you, uh, don't, you don't need to trade him. That's the thing. Is right. Dave Robertson, uh, Holland, uh, Gonzalez, Frazier. Those are all guys with expiring contracts. Is is you right. either have to flip them or they, you know, they just they, you you lose them. They, you get nothing. Right. Exactly. Uh, it, I'm. I don't think. Uh, well, no. Melky Cabrera, I could see being dealt. I just don't think he'll get very much in return. But when you're rebuilding, take what you could get. Because Melky Cabrera is interesting. He's not a bad player. But, like, if someone needs, like, an outfielder, like, a a, a star outfielder for, like, you know, a playoff run, I don't think Melky Cabrera is going to be the first one on people's minds. I think it's going to be more of a... We have an injury to one of our depth guys, and we need someone to kind of be a, a platoon or some kind of guy out there, and Melky Cabrera may be a guy you're more tempted to get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe five, ten years ago, uh, it would be the former, but it's now with the way baseball goes and uh, on-base percentage being important, I think is Melky Cabrera becomes a somebody has to trade for them out of absolute necessity rather than luxury. Right, it's because, like I said, you're the Sox are saying, "Hey, our big assets, we could trade our, you know, potentially Quintana, David Robertson, um, you know, maybe Garcia, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Who knows what's going to happen with that? But you know, Robertson and Quintana are the guys for sure that are going to get phone calls for. The others are just kind of." We may need it. And you know what? It's very possible that it will happen. And it's very possible that you'll get something good in return for that. It's just, it's not as set in stone. Like, you look at some teams and you say, they're the perfect suitor for Quintana. They're the perfect suitor for Robertson. With guys like Frazier and Cabrera, it's kind of a injury-by-injury injury basis. Or fill-in-need-by-fill-in-need by fill in need basis. You don't really know. Yep. Uh, an interesting thing is Tuesday's game against the Angels is I, I didn't catch that game, but we all know how much Hawk Harrelson loves Yaz. That's his guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Albert I know exactly Pujols passed Yaz on the all-time RBI list, and I wish I could have been there to hear what kind of nonsense came out of uh, Hawk Harrelson's mouth regarding regarding. Uh, the situation will you know pool is great player but uh boy yes he just he was something and when i played with him i i just knew that you know he had the twtw at pool great player but i don't think he has the same twtw as yes had uh, i i was talking to somebody before and uh, they were they were talking about their experience of something and that made their opinion correct and i said Listen, not discounting it, but Hawk Harrelson not only was a player, a major league player, he was also a general manager and a longtime announcer. And the man still said that uh, Todd Frazier was just as good as Chris Bryant and said it with a straight face. That uh, that was that was funny. That was that was really funny. It was it was honestly the dumbest thing i've ever heard during a baseball broadcast yeah and steve stone tried to like change the subject but he wouldn't let it go 
Like, he kept trying to change the subject, but he went on and on. And it was one thing where even Sox fans are like, okay, really? Like, I know not, you're a hometown guy, but still. It's not even a knock on Todd Frazier. It's, you're talking about a guy who was rookie of the year, his, his rookie year, and MVP his second year, and won the World Series. Like, he's a special player. He is a special player. And, one of the best players in baseball. Uh, and he is, he is the face. He, like, he is one of three players that's the face of baseball. And Todd Frazier is a guy that you, you can't even trade. Right. Now, Todd Frazier has had some success in his career. There's no doubt about that. He's always had good pop. Uh, he's put on a show in the Home Run Derby. Um, he, it's kind of funny. He's been around longer than we remember. He's been around since like 2011. And, you know, it feels like he hasn't been around quite as long, but he's 31. Uh, career batting average, 258. Career on base percentage is 315. Career OPS is 775. I mean, the guy's really, he's a, he's a home run hitter. He's had some really good years in Cincinnati, like 2014, 273, 336, 795. You know, that's that's pretty good. The year after that is last year with Cincinnati, 309 on base percentage, but he had a really good first half. But, you know, overall, he's, he's, he's a home run guy. That's what he is. He's not an on base guy. Uh, he's a guy who's going to strike out probably on average 130 times a season, maybe a little more. Last year he struck out 163 times. He's just he's not a complete player. He's just he's just not. Um and, and two more things I wanted to talk about the White Sox is one is I it wasn't something I'd thought of consciously. It was as I was going through some of the box scores after games and mm -hmm. getting notes ready for the, the show is um is this is going to be a huge deal going forward of how Rick Hahn remedies this in the long term. But here's here in the Angels series, uh, Monday's game, the the White Sox walked twice against the pitcher with control issues. Tuesday mm -hmm. in an eleven inning game, two walks. Wednesday uh, in a game that they scored eight runs. They only walked twice. In the Mariners series, they the first game, they scored four runs on three home runs and only had one walk. Uh, Friday's game is in 10 innings, two walks. Saturday's game, two walks. Uh, it was Finally, today's game, was they had six walks. But how, if you're not getting guys on base, how are you expecting to drive in more runs the White Sox do not walk a lot um, that's something that I think is pretty obvious I'm looking at fan graphs right now and I'm gonna look at kind of where they are in terms of base on balls uh, I can't believe it's not on this dashboard okay here we go base on balls walks they're dead last. They're yeah, dead last in walks. I would have been shocked if they weren't last. Yeah, they they are they they just don't walk a lot. Um, I mean Tim Anderson. Don't get me wrong. I think the kids got a really bright future, especially defensively. Kids a stud, and he can hit the ball a long way. But ask any Sox fan, they'll tell you he doesn't walk a lot. Kind of like Starlin Castro, he didn't walk a lot. Abreu doesn't really walk a lot. Um, obviously, El Garcia doesn't walk a lot. I talked about it in my Sabermetrics article about him. Uh, Melky Cabrera, I don't think he really walks that much. I mean, who's the guy who leads that team with walks these days? Like, I don't even know. Is it is it Todd Frazier? Is it Jose Abreu, even though he doesn't walk all that much? I, I don't even know. I that's an interesting question because none of them walk very much. So it's, it's so interesting to, to even guess Is it like Tyler Saladino. <laughs> I don't even know. Does Tyler Saladino even still play? Like, 
<laughs> is he still a thing? I I don't know. He, he, I think he played he played today, I believe. Did he? Um, because I know he's been kind of in and out. I wasn't sure if he was like hurt or not, or they weren't really playing him as much because Yomar Sanchez and Lurie Garcia were playing a little bit better. So Todd Frazier leads the White Sox with walks with 16 in 123 oh. at bats. Oh. Yeah, they only have 106 total walks. Tyler Saladino is third with 13. Who's second? Uh, uh, Narvaez. Omar Narvaez, okay. Where? How many walks does Avisel Garcia have? Uh, seven. Seven walks. In 157 at bats. Well, like I said, I looked at his base on ball rate and it was very low and his BABIP was very high when I last looked at him a few weeks ago. He's obviously still crushing the ball and that's impressive on its own, but, you know, clearly doesn't walk a lot. I mean, he's still batting 350. Yeah, that's, but, that's pretty but good. His, but his on base is 390. So <laughs> Right, so there's not much of a difference. Yeah. Uh, Tim Anderson, 148 at bats, four walks. Four. Four walks. Wow. Yeah, Matt Davidson, 102 at bats, eight walks. Melky Cabrera, 154 at bats. Uh, yeah, he he's second on the White Sox in at bats. He's got 12 walks. Jose Abreu leads the White Sox in at bats in 161, 12 mm -hmm. walks. Wow. You would think, I mean, I know the White Sox were never really big on walks, but you would think like some like guys like Jose Abreu would be a little better at that, but I know he never really was huge on walks. Could hit for average, hit for power, hit for production, but the the walks never really were there. Um uh, yeah, I the, the the team that leads the league in walks the Rays, second is the Cubs. The Rays at number one have 180 walks, and the White Sox have 106. So that's quite a difference between the two. Yeah, the, the Cubs have four guys that have more walks than anybody on the White Sox. Yeah. Bryant, Rizzo, Schwarber, and Zobrist. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's that's we know that's who they are. They are they are guys who walk. Um you know, Matt Davidson. Matt Davidson is reminding me a lot of kind of what I know it's early. But he's kind of reminding me a lot of what they wanted Adam Dunn to do, minus the walks, because he strikes out a lot and he hits a lot of home runs, but I feel like Matt Davidson has been a bit more timely with his hits, while Adam Dunn really wasn't with the White Sox, because we know Adam Dunn did walk a lot, but he also struck out a lot and hit home runs. I just feel like Matt Davidson is doing it in a bit more timely fashion than Adam Dunn ever did. Uh, just as an FYI, is Ian Happ already has more walks than Tim Anderson and in 26 at-bats. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about with the White Sox is it looks like they are going to sign uh, international free agent, potential superstar, Louis Robert, uh, former Cuban player. Only 19 years old. He's been praised by so many people the numbers he's put up in cuba are very impressive looks like he's got a real pretty swing it was between them and the cardinals went to the Sox. Uh, i think that the i mean first of all jose abreu helped it all with the cuban connection but the white Sox overall have such a good history with cuban connections i think that really helped sway his opinion i heard a national league scout describe him as this he's yasiel puig but with better ability to play center field. He's like Adam Jones or Mike Cameron, except with a bigger, stronger body at a young age. He's Jorge Soler, but with better ba uh, better speed uh, and arm. Yeah, those are some pretty good qualities right there. Uh, I mean, he's 19 years old. I mean, we all saw Jorge, Jorge Soler assigned like, similarly with the Cubs as very, very young um, and... He never materialized to what we thought he would be. Uh, and you saw the potential, but you never saw it materialize. So, I mean, you, that's always the possibility. 
especially with foreign players. But this has got to be a great situation for the White Sox. A, for us, because it's, he's not going to the Cardinals. It's exa- This is the first thing I said. I just said, thank you for not going to St. Louis. Thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, but he's... He's a long way off from being major league ready. Oh uh, yeah, he's nineteen. He's super talented, but um, you know, he, the the White Sox have probably far and away the most tantalizing prospects in baseball. Uh, if they can have even half of them materialize, they're gonna in a couple years they're gonna be a really good team. Absolutely. And when we're looking at Louis Roberts, we're probably talking, at least the estimate is from what I've heard from experts, and it's hard to predict this kind of thing. We're talking maybe two or three years away, but, uh, you know, the the wait is worth it. As Cubs fans, trust me, the wait is worth it. Uh, I think when you look at their top prospects, I think the three guys I pay the most attention to are Moncada, now Roberts, and Dane Dunning, because Dane Dunning and Michael Kopech, too. So I'd say four. Uh, I'd say Kopech and Dunning are your two kind of big pitchers you have right now in the farm. And then your two position guys are Moncada and uh, Louis Roberts. And, and I mean, and just think if you don't trade uh, Jose Quintana, you still have Jose Quintana on your rotation. You've got um, Carson Fulmer, who's, uh, you know, right at the, the cusp of the major league level. And... Uh, Rodon, if if he's able to figure out the command issues, that kid has just absolutely sick, filthy stuff. Right. He's just. I I think the potential is fully there, and we've seen flashes of it. It's just got to prove to be consistent, whether it's with the way he performs or just staying healthy on the field. That's another big thing. Yeah. So I mean, theoretically, this White Sox team could be a juggernaut. Absolutely. Uh, right. In a few years, yeah. I mean, you know, you got to develop. You got to do everything right. You got to make sure it all goes right. But uh, the potential is fully there. Yeah. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting. To, to, it's going to be an interesting run of Chicago baseball over the next decade. After having a dry spell of both teams being bad. Um, so that's all I really have about the White Sox. Um, the one last thing I wanted to talk about before we call it a night is I, I wasn't going to bring anything bears wise, but, uh, an article, I think it was Dan Weeder, um, that, that wrote it, but it, they wrote a story about the bears pursuit of Mitchell Trubisky. And I don't know if you read this, but the story of, about how they went after, uh, pursued him was pretty hilarious because they were they wanted to be so secretive about their their pursuit of him they didn't want to give of the scent because they identified he was the guy they wanted and if they felt that other teams wanted him people would start moving up or the two teams ahead of him would would take him but they ultimately went down to and have a private workout with him in north carolina and they went out to dinner with him and uh, apparently, Mitch Trubisky made the reservation where they ate in the basement of a restaurant, but he made the reg- reservation under James McMahon. I did not read that. That is so interesting. And uh, apparently is they brought John uh, John Fox, Ryan Pace, uh, uh, Dave Ragone, the quarterback's coach, and Dowell Loggins, the offensive coordinator, and they all flopped there and had a steak dinner with Mitch Trubisky and apparently they were kicking John Fox under the table because he had a few drinks in him and wouldn't shut up and they really just wanted to learn more about the kid and he, oh was, my goodness. he was holding court and so they were trying to kick him under the table and get him to shut up <laughs> I kind of want to see what drunk John Fox is like not going to lie apparently he is a chatty Kathy but uh when it Did I tell came... you about the time when I found a dollar bill on the ground? And you know, I would just love to hear that. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he's he's so gruff with the media. But it, you know, I the, he's well loved in the coaching circle, so he's got to be a riot. I just want to. I would love to see drunk John Fox 
hanging out with uh, um, uh, drunk. Uh, I have my drawing a blank on the coach of the Patriots, uh, Bill or uh, Bill Belichick. Belichick. Like I, just to hear what those two have to say when there's no cameras on and and nothing will get leaked to the media is they probably have so much held inside that they don't want anybody outside of the walls to know that they probably just become little schoolgirls. You know, I really think what you do is complete trash because you cheat the system all the time. And you know what? That's just stupid. And I don't like it. But you know what? Peyton Manning will always have more respect than your guy. That would be really funny to listen to. Like, I'd be so curious to hear what they'd have to say. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But it's a uh, so Mitch Trubisky they identified as their guy, and when they got closer to the day, is they tightened the circle of who was in the know that he was their guy, and the reason that the trade came about was not because the 49ers were getting trade requests, but people were calling the Bears about moving to the number three spot to take Mitch Trubisky, that the Bears went, crap, we need to move up because we already know the the, the Browns broadcast of the world, what they were doing with the number one pick. We have to move up to number two. Uh, and part of their reasoning was they kept talking about his special um, – ball placement and his his special accuracy and i went back to watch some more tape of him because it's quarterback is a really hard position to watch tape on it's it's you know with a lot of other positions is you can identify certain traits that project well and certain traits that do not quarterback is really hard and i fully admit i'm, I'm not that good at it as far as quarterbacks there's other positions i'm pretty darn good at so i went back and i started watching and if I'll be damned is this kid, the ball placement, not, you know, there's a, it's one thing you look at completion percentage and completion percentage, a scout I, I met had told me this, that the one thing that you can look at with quarterbacks coming from college to pros is accurate or their completion percentage, because their completion percentage going from college to pros is probably never going to go higher. It's going to go lower if anything. Um, so if you have a guy with a low completion percentage in college, probably not going to translate well. He had a really high, almost a 70% completion percentage. But when you watched the completions, it sometimes wide receivers, you know, catch the ball that should have been a drop, uh, whether it's thrown behind, thrown high, thrown low. Right. But you watch the placement of when Mitchell Th Trubisky throws it. And you think about it is if it say it's a crossing pattern is thrown behind a guy is you could get the completion, but he's probably going to get tackled right then and there because his momentum is, is changing and he's going to get tackled. But if you hit a guy in stride in the perfect spot where he can just keep running, that could be the difference between a four yard gain and a 25 yard gain. And that's the accuracy that you see with Mitch Trubisky is he hits the player like in the, you know, right in the perfect target is the accuracy is, is so good. And that's the, what they saw and they all fell in love with is you can't teach that. You can teach how to, how to take a snap from under center, how to read a defense, um, how to be more patient in the pocket, how to protect the ball better, but you can't teach accuracy. And I, I think that's the one outstanding thing feature and uh, that they, they saw in him. And when I went back and watched the tape, it's really true is you just watch the ball placement. And if you were to chart where on the receiver's body, the ball uh, is thrown to, and if you were to devise some sort of uh, like new metric of, you know, completion percentage, but if you get more points, if it's, you know, in a, right on the player's hands versus uh, above his head or below his knees or behind him or, you know, where he's got to dive. Uh, it, he would be he would be far and away better than any of the other quarterbacks I looked at. 
And it yeah, was and that's that's one thing I heard too. You know, if there was a metric kind of like the uh, defensive metrics in baseball that involve route efficiency and percentage of catches, that'd be something really cool to have, like in football. Yeah, and, and the the one other thing is um, that uh, Ryan Pace apparently um, somebody had noted that the Bears there was no talk about them drafting Mitch Trubisky so much so that maybe the Bears had interest in Mitch Trubisky and Ryan and some but somebody said it jokingly not like you know investigatively and Ryan Pace apparently freaked out and was oh, like boy. maybe maybe they had been too good at at uh, not showing their hand that he had to leak some false information about um trading back for another player or something and uh because he was just like uh, they, they were too good at, at playing the game yeah that's really interesting i think it's one of those things where though we all overreacted initially and i'll admit i was one of them one thing you just kind of got to look into the circumstances and sometimes it makes more sense once you do yeah and i and you know if if ryan pace is right and who Mitch Trubisky is. Nobody's going to care about a second rounder or a third round player or whatever they gave up. Nobody's going to care. Right. You know, nobody's going to care at all if he turns out to be what they think. And if you think about the accuracy thing is that's the difference between a Tom Brady and a Aaron Rodgers versus, um, you know, a, a, another quarterback is those guys just have special accuracy. And if, if Mitch Trubisky turns out to be, you know, anywhere near as good as those two, uh, you have to be elated. Right, exactly. We want to be proven wrong for our skepticism. That's what we want. That's what we're praying for. We want to be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I don't really have anything else. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Alex? No, not really. Um, I know every time we end the show, I kind of ask you about the other sports that are going on, but, uh, you know, uh, the NBA hasn't been interesting at all. It's just a bunch of blowouts. It's going to be Golden State and the Cavs easily. Um, the NHL playoffs have taken kind of a black turn. I, I just, there's really nothing else interesting right now in the playoff kind of world. So, you know, really just kind of focus on the Cubs at this point and, baseball in general uh so i really got nothing else yeah that's gonna do it uh you know for me as well um you know it's uh it's gonna be funny because the the Cavs and the golden state warriors are gonna end up playing each other in the finals and both teams will be undefeated going into it uh so game one will be the first time one of those teams loses um but yeah i guess that's gonna be it for this episode of bill swirsky sports talk chicago Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, please make sure that you subscribe however you listen to your podcast, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Uh, hit us up on social media, at ShyFanPat1, at Swirsky Sports, uh, SwirskySports.com, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports. Share with your friends. And thank you so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Uh, 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the bears go bearing down.